Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Spectrum wants to hear your views. You can SMS at any time during the show. Type Spectrum, leave a space, type in your contribution and name, then send it to 7197. Your views, our interviews on Spectrum, Radio 1 FM 90. Hello, a very warm welcome. This is Spectrum on Radio 1. I'm your host, Edmond Chisito. On Spectrum tonight, is Uganda heading in the right direction 50 years after attaining its independence? How can our former colonial masters, Britain, help the country realize its aspirations? 50 years ago this month, the symbol of colonialism in Uganda, the British Union Jack, was lowered, marking the end of the colonial era. The country was handed over to Ugandans who took on the challenge of building a nation under the keen watch of its former colonial masters. Thereafter, Uganda faced many challenges, considering what happened to the first constitution, the 1966 crisis, and the turmoil that followed in the years that followed. In many other African countries, colonialists laid the foundation upon which African leaders were expected to propel their countries to greater heights as expected by the masses. In Uganda, the British are remembered for building the cash crop economy, ushering in education and facilitating modern trade, although many people detest the role they played in slave trade. Many say that the British are responsible for some of the challenges Uganda faces, especially at the level of governance, since they introduced the so-called, well, the divide and rule system. The British are also blamed for the bad blood in courts between the central government and Bugatti, the Uganda Kingdom, with some historians saying that the British left many questions unanswered after the historic Lancaster independence talks. Today, the Baganda say that the British granted their kingdom independence on the 8th of October, creating a federal state within another state. Our former colonial master, Britain, is among the key partners helping Uganda to overcome its challenges in order to realize its potential, especially the independence aspirations. So tonight, we seek the views of the British government about the state of affairs in Uganda, considering the challenges at hand. We'll also find out how the British are planning to help Uganda beyond the 50 years, and what exactly the Golden, the golden Jubilee means to them as a former colonial master. Our guests tonight are Excellence, Alison Blackburn, British High Commissioner to Uganda. You're most welcome, Madam Blackburn. Thank you. Mm-hmm. We're also joined by Mr. Daniel Gray Moore, the head of office at the UK's De- Department for International Development or DFID. You're most welcome, Mr. Gray Moore. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. Uh, Madam Blackburn, to what extent did Britain, as a former colonial power, contribute to Uganda's development? Well, um, Edmund, first of all, I'd like to say um, both uh, Daniel and I are relatively new in, uh, in Uganda. I've been here uh, a few weeks. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure actually to be here at such a significant time which is the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of of independence and actually um, we are particularly pleased to be able to celebrate that with a a visit of uh, His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent and there's particular significance with that because he was actually here 50 years ago at independence. Um, You've referred to some of the things which have, uh, some of the issues which have happened in the last 50 years Um, and of course Jubilee's uh, anniversaries are a time for uh, reflection on what's gone on in the in the past and uh, what has happened in the last 50 years to Uganda um, has been has included some difficult times some dark times Um, but it is also uh, involved uh, particularly over the last um, several years the last um, 20 years uh, a, a significant amount of progress and um, the UK is very proud both of its historical links with Uganda but also the part that we have played, are playing and will continue to play in Uganda's development and um, you, Edmund, referred to us um, as former colonial masters. Actually, we like to look at the relationship in a, in a much more modern way um, so we are partners, whether that's partners in development assistance, increasingly um, trade, uh, whether that's that's the, the links and the, 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 the contacts that we have between our, our militaries, on arts and, and a number of, a whole wide spectrum of issues, some of which His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent will be able to see during his visit. Um, so it's very much a, a forward look um, that we would like to have uh, coming up to this uh, independent, very important independence anniversary. And to what extent did Britain contribute to Uganda's troubles? 
Um, you can have, I'm sure historians can have long debates about, about that. As I say, we would like to focus more on, um, of course, there, as I said, there were some, uh, some uh, uh, difficult times in Uganda's history, if that's what, uh, if that's what you're, you're referring to. Um, as I say, our, our uh, reflection on this is to how uh, we as the UK have uh, made a contribution, particularly over the last 20 years, to the enormous progress that Uganda has made. And I think that's, um, we're talking about celebrations for this uh, anniversary, and there is a lot to celebrate, um, but there's also a lot of potential that we would like to be a part of moving forward in the, in the bilateral relationship. Well, obviously, as you mark 50 years, you'll be, one will be looking at reflecting on the past to try and get momentum for the future. Yes. You granted Uganda independence, yes. and four years later, that was trouble began and it lasted 20 years. Would Britain have uh, foreseen this coming? Um, I wasn't, I say, I'm sure historians could debate long and, and, and hard about um, what happened um, uh, in the past. Um, uh, as they are of focus now is on uh, what our relationship is like at the moment and what we are going to be doing uh, at the moment but also moving forward. All right. I mean, there are things that Uganda has been able to do over the past 26 years, like you said, where there's been progress in your own words. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that Uganda has done in the last 26 years that they should have done, you know, shortly after independence to avoid the turmoil, 20 years? Um, there are, um, uh, say, there, there's been a lot of progress, um, but there are still areas. And I, I say, I newly arrived in the relatively newly arrived in the country, um, but it's it's still clear that there are there are still a lot of challenges. Um, uh, uh, I, I was, for example, um, Daniel and I were um, up in the uh, in the north only a couple of weeks ago. We were in in Gulu looking at some of the projects which DFID funds. That's a an area of the country which um, until relatively recently um, has had has suffered with um, instability and violence and so on and that there are still huge challenges particularly in that part of the country also in places like Karamoja um, uh, uh, and there are challenges more generally which our development assistance program is targeted at, at helping and focusing on eradication of poverty but also again looking to the future helping Uganda to development uh, develop uh, as a uh, in, in trade um, make the best of the oil and gas, uh, sorry, the oil finds that um, that have, 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 have been discovered recently um, uh, and, and improving the lives of Ugandans uh, throughout the country. Well, listeners, this is Spectrum on Radio 1 tonight. Is Uganda heading the in the right direction 50 years after attaining its independence? How can our former colonial masters, Britain, help the country realize its aspirations? Our guests, Her Excellence, Alison Blackburn, the British High Commissioner to Uganda, Mr. Daniel Gramer, Head of Office, the UK Def the Department for International Development. Daniel, how has the, the DFID helped Uganda get to where it is now, economically? Well, we've been working in uh, Uganda for the last uh, 20 odd years, working, well indeed before that as well, but in the last 20 years, as Alison was saying, there's been some very significant progress. And I think we've been able to play a part in supporting that. I mean, the post-1986 settlement, the work that was done, you asked a moment ago about what might have been done in the 26 years immediately after independence that was done in the last 26 years, and I think some of those things would include obviously bringing, you know, order and security to the streets, the success that the government has had in terms of making actually personal safety um, something that people can be sure of, the work that was done to improve the economy, um, to uh, bring the economy under control, to support economic growth. There's been 20 odd years of 7% growth rates, which is you know, fantastic and has really driven down poverty rates within the country. Um, there's been new investment, of course, in education and in health and a whole variety of areas. So, you know, any country that does those things well might have benefited had they started those things sooner, but there are reasons, of course, why it was hard to do it. DFID, the UK government working in Uganda, has worked to support those processes. We've given support to ministries of finance, to the Bank of Uganda. We've worked with your health sector, with your education sector. Um, we've worked with a wide range of partners to really help to drive forward the sort of poverty reduction. You know, in the end, it's of course the credit of the government here, um, but I think we have played a part by being a firm partner during that time. How does DFID structure its aid to this country? Well, at the moment, we have a 
programme that focuses on a number of areas. We've got a big focus on the north. Um, Alison mentioned this a moment ago. We've been to Gulu. I went with Alison and I went to a, a couple of weeks previously as well. So in my very short time that I've spent in Uganda, I feel I've got to know Gulu anyway, <laughs> if not many other places yet. Um, and it was fascinating being in Gulu. I mean, that focus on the north, which Alison pointed out, you know, is clearly um, an incredibly important area for the government of Uganda, um, for government ministers, and we are, as ever, looking to prioritise our work behind government priorities. And so we want to support that work in the north. The post-conflict agenda in the north, working with the youth who, of course, um, many of whom have spent years in camps, have lost all sorts of skills, farming skills, manufacturing skills, have not had the opportunity to have good education, um, working to build up businesses, working to give grants to people, working to help in reconciliation. There's a big agenda there. And what I was very struck by in the work that we're doing in the north when I went to Gulu is that only, what, six, seven years ago, at night, Gulu would have had many, many children and others sleeping on the streets, seeking sanctuary, seeking to avoid the huge risks that there were um, in the countryside from the Lord's Resistance Army. And actually what we saw when we went through Gulu was a bustling town, mm -hmm. businesses, shops selling all sorts of things, uh, people full of actually enthusiasm mm -hmm. and full of optimism mm -hmm. and talking about the opportunities of trade for instance with South Sudan or with uh, Eastern DRC or of course with the rest of uh, Uganda. So it's very exciting to see how much can be achieved in what was quite a short period of time um, and I think the work that we're doing there supporting the government through as I say um, peace and reconciliation work and supporting economic growth and jobs um, is I hope really playing a part. So that's only one of our priorities in our work here. Well you've given us a synopsis of what you've done in Gulu. Uh, can you give us a broader profile of the GFID and its help to Uganda? Certainly, absolutely. Well, um, we're doing uh, broader work on economic growth. Um, clearly this is a very important area. I mean, I mentioned Uganda's growth rates over the last 20 years, which have been very impressive. And even with the global financial crisis over the last few years, um, actually it's more than a few years now, isn't it, which is quite scary, um, but over the extended last few years, uh, Uganda's growth has remained substantial and it of course is predicted to go back up to the sort of 7% growth rates which is fantastic. However, of course, one of the challenges, and it's a, not a challenge exclusive to Uganda, is translating that growth into jobs for people so that they are employed gainfully, that they're paying taxes, that they have the opportunities to be skilled, etc. So we're doing a number of things in that area to support uh, Uganda. One of them relates to regional trade. Uganda, of course, is a member of the East African community. And that community has set out a really ambitious agenda around joining up in terms of trade and other areas, including, of course, in time, a monetary union. And in fact, the East African community is working with other regional economic communities in Southern Africa and Kamesa, which stretches, of course, all the way up to uh, Egypt. Um, and that agenda of regional trade is going to be very important for Uganda to trade with its neighbours and to more easily trade beyond its neighbours as well, to use the seaports of Tanzania and Kenya, for instance. So we're working to improve investment in roads, um, to improve investments in border crossings, to make it quicker and easier and cheaper for traders to get across the border um, and trade, instead of having a situation at the moment where you, have, you can have days or weeks of lorries all backed up to get over the border. We've been working to support um, easing of the systems, the sort of soft infrastructure, the actual trade agreements between countries to harmonise that and make that simpler. So all of that is designed, of course, to make doing business cheaper and easier so that there's more investment and more jobs in time for um, Ugandans. So that, that's one of the very big areas of our work. Um, another area is in relation to health. Um, as you'd imagine, it's a big area. There's been, of course, a lot of investment in Uganda. Um, there's been some success um, in important areas. But in terms of the Millennium Development Goals, there's still some way to go, particularly around maternal health and child health. 
So we're doing work um, focused, for instance, on increasing access to family planning um, for, for mothers, for women, um, with the view also to improving child health in those areas. We also in health are doing work in the north of the country, again, around generally improving health provision in that region, trying to find new models that will really reach out to some of the um, harder to reach communities. Um, we're doing work also uh, generally on things like public financial management. So we work closely with the Bank of Uganda, with the Ministry of Finance and with others to really help implement the, the agenda that the government has to ensure that government financial systems, basically, you know, how budgeting happens, how money is spent, how you track it going through, how you make sure that what they say is going to be spent in the budget is actually what is spent at the end, that that whole thing actually works. We're putting a lot of support into that with other um, partners as well. So, I don't know, there's a number of examples. We're also working in Karamoja uh, right. on food security. So a range of things that we're, we're doing to really help drive forward better health, growth, jobs and improving governance in the country. All right, well, obviously we'll try to get some more detail on that mm. later as we go on. Madam High Commissioner, mm -hmm. could you talk to, could you characterize for us British-Uganda relations at the moment? They are um, both wide-ranging, broad, and I mentioned some of the areas before, um, and, and very positive. I mean, we have, obviously, you've referred to them, uh, our historical roots, but um, our relationship is based on much more than that, and I, I refer to a, a, a modern relationship, uh, which is very much the way we view it. Yes, we're an important development partner, um, but we're also an increasingly important trade partner of Uganda, and it's part of my remit. Um, and uh, you know, I've discussed with, uh, for example, the Minister of Trade how we can try and improve uh, the, the the amounts of trade that's done between our two countries. Um, but it goes into other areas uh, like um, like uh, the arts, um, culture, um, uh, like the military links that we have. I mean, Uganda is playing, of course, a a crucial role in the African Union um, force in in Somalia. Um, and you know, we are very uh, pleased and uh, and, and uh, uh, proud to be able to, uh, to to provide some training, which goes into the uh, uh, support for for that effort. So it's it's really a, a wide range of um, of areas, and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of human contact. There are um, Ugandans who. Uh, live in the UK, who go and study in the UK, um, uh, a great interest, I think, uh, even when it comes to things like football. Um, I'm a great football fan. Um, I'm very struck by the, the number of uh, Arsenal, Liverpool, Chelsea shirts, um, the, 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 uh, the popularity of the, of the Premier League um, is, uh, you know, is, is, is one of the small but I think important uh, manifestations. And I say I, we, uh, uh, there are students who, who go and study in the UK, and indeed, we, the UK has provided 48 scholarships this year. Um, 48 scholarships. 48 scholarships. That's a combination of uh, British government-funded scholarships, but also private sector. So Tullow Oil uh, has provided some scholarships, which the British Council have uh, have administered. So it's, uh, I say, it's a very wide-ranging, and I would say, modern relationship that we want to develop for the next 50 years. We'll talk about the next 50 years. What, how you see things uh, evolving? But very briefly, you touched on. Tullow. The oil and gas sector again is soon to become an oil producing country, one of the top 50 probably at, you know, uh, in a couple of years' time. Tallo is only one of three part active partners in the oil industry. It's the smallest of the three. Is Britain happy with that kind of leverage? Well, this is a this is a commercial um, relationship that um, that, uh, that that and a commercial um, uh, a deal that that, that Tallo has. So um, uh, it's not for the British government to to, to say what sort of of uh, share Tullow should have. It's a commercial relationship. Well, but one would expect to see you, the British, having a higher stake. You have the Chinese and the, 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 the you know, having a bigger... These things are done on a... Companies, you're these, by smaller companies. These things are done on an entirely commercial basis. So that's, uh, it's the market which, uh, which, which rules there. Well, this is Petram on Radio 1. We'll go for a break. We'll be back. Do stay tuned. One, two, three, come on, Jack. We go, we go.
is 13th October 2012, Mandela National Stadium, Nambole, Uganda Cranes vs Zambia. Brought to you by FUFA and MTN. Everywhere you go. The Woolworths Quality Sale is now on. Get up to 40% of selected fashion clothing at Woolworths Metroplex Mall, Northern Bypass, Nalia, and Garden City Shopping Center, Lower Kololo. But hurry, or you'll miss out. Woolworths, the difference. As we celebrate 50 special years, Nile Special invites you to toast to our great land. Nile Special, the rich, rewarding taste from the source. You've earned it. When I see from the Nile. Not for sale to persons under 18. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Welcome back on Spectrum tonight. Is Uganda heading in the right direction 50 years after attaining its independence? How our, con our former colonial masters, Britain, helped the country realize its aspirations? Our guests tonight, Her Excellence Alison Blackburn, the British High Commissioner to Uganda, and Mr. Daniel Graymer, Head of Office, UK's Department for International Development, or DFID. He will be able to call in and contribute to this discussion. Madam High Commissioner, where do you see Uganda going in the next 50 years? That's really a question for Uganda, and it's uh, it's a it, uh, you know one of the very striking things uh, as say as a relative newcomer to this country is the vibrancy that there is of um, debate and discussion on uh, that issue and many others. And of course, coming up to the anniversary of, uh, of independence, it is a time for both reflection but also looking forward. Um, we've noted in the earlier part of the programme a lot of the progress that has been made, and the UK is, is very proud to have been uh, a significant partner in, in helping that in, in, in many uh, areas. Um, but there are uh, significant challenges which Uganda still has. Um, uh, it's why we are still a significant partner on development assistance. Um, there is huge potential uh, in Uganda for uh, uh, economic development, uh, trade. Uh, one of the things that we would like to see is um, the, uh, I mentioned it before, the bilateral trade between our two countries growing, um, uh, an improvement in the, in, the, in the business environment to ensure that that happens. Um, uh, there, are, there is the huge opportunity which the uh, oil fines uh, in, in the country presents, but one of the challenges will be, um, and this is what Parliament is, is looking at with the bills currently uh, before Parliament, um, to ensure that the revenues which come from that are um, used uh, in, a, in a way which um, ensures that in 50 years time Uganda has indeed lived up to the potential uh, which it has and which its people deserve. Well there were aspirations you had as you gave us independence in 1962, good governance, respect for human rights, economic empowerment. Do you see this having been realized broadly? As we noted before there have been since independence there have been some dark times in Uganda's history when those things were not, clearly not uh, ha happening. Um, over the last 20 years there has been um, enormous progress on things like democracy um, uh, and, and, and human rights. Um, however, uh, that's not to say that there is not uh, a need still to uh, look at how that can develop further, um, ensuring that there is uh, uh, the, the full right of freedom for everybody to express um, uh, their views um, and that all rights, um, uh, human rights, are, are respected. I mean, again, that's something that uh, we uh, work with both the government, uh, uh, various institutions, and civil society on those sorts of things because it is a work in progress. You think there's, a, there's some intolerance to political dissent? 
Um, I uh, I think that there is always uh, uh, a need for every country to reflect on uh, whether it's giving the full space to uh, everybody who wants to express a view. Um, there have certainly been uh, controversies here in in in, in the past uh, few years, but one of the things that I think is very positive, and as say as a, as a relative newcomer, is to look at the very vibrant debate that there is about these issues. And I think you only have to look in in the media or listen to debates in Parliament to hear that there are different views about these things. So um, uh, that's exactly the sort of uh, uh, debate, discussion, reflection that we would like to uh, encourage Ugandans to uh, to to have and to work out their own way forward. Really. Then you do think the, the legislature is free from interference by the executive? Well, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I, so I've been here uh, about six, seven weeks, and my time, therefore, in Kampala and Uganda, as I was saying before, has been quite limited. I had the very good fortune to... Normally, there's a time to get acclimatized to the food. That's, uh, yes. <laughs> Besides the weather. Hopefully, I, I came across from, uh, from Ghana, and uh, my climatizing was, uh, I think, quite effective on the way over. Uh, but no, I've really, I've really enjoyed being here. It's been fantastic. And I had the very good fortune to spend much of Wednesday last week at the launch of a new parliamentary institute that's been set up here um, that has the express job of helping to build up the capacity and the skills of parliamentarians to enable them to really do the job they have to do. And as I was saying at that uh, launch, actually, I mean, it's very clear that the job of a parliamentarian is incredibly hard. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a civil servant. I obviously spend a lot of time um, working in London, in Whitehall, around the British Parliament, and I spend a lot of time dealing with ministers and other MPs, and I see the demands that there are on people. They're pulled in so many different directions. People have often quite unrealistic expectations of quite what they can do. And they, they need the kind of support, the kind of training. I, I understand that in the last election there was a turnover of about two-thirds of parliamentarians. Um, that's a huge turnover and a huge loss of institutional knowledge. So I think this institute and in parliament will play a really good job at helping them do the job of parliamentarians and parliament, which is scrutiny. Scrutiny of what um, legislation is being proposed, helping to amend it and adapt it, and making sure that parliament can help to drive forward this good governance. And when you look at the sort of issues that they are then scrutinising, there's huge variety. They're looking at the environmental impact of oil, looking at the revenue management of oil, they're looking at issues of climate change, you know, decisions about what to do on quality of education will have impacts for generations to come. You know, very few people can have the intrinsic knowledge and skills to do those, to look in each of those areas and make the right decisions. So I think the institute will be good, and I think Parliament looks very vibrant, as Alison was saying more generally about the, the body politic here. Parliament is very vibrant, there's lots of debate, we've seen this debate about the health budget recently. We've seen debates about oil that have been incredibly lively. I think Parliament looks like it's doing a very good job, as any Parliament should do, scrutinising what's coming through. Madam High Commissioner, I would like us to talk about the, uh, the, independent, the Golden Jubilee uh, weekend. Mm. But before we do that, why did Britain give you Uganda independence on October the 8th before giving Uganda the independence? That's a nice the try, day. Edmund. <laughs> You tried this before and say I'd, I'd really uh, our approach is to is to look forward I think the historians can can rake over the past 50 years um, of course you can't ignore it but very much our focus is on the future well it has repercussions on the future how do you think looking at the future how, how should the, 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 the central government handle demands by Uganda for a federal state that's really not for that's really not for us to say that's uh, that's for the government of Uganda so um, I suggest you uh, you ask them the government of Uganda. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Golden Jubilee weekend. What is likely to happen? Do we have special people coming? Do we have some special guests from the monarchy in Britain? Well, yes, as I mentioned before, we are very um, uh, honoured, uh, and I, as a High Commissioner, very honoured in my first few weeks to um, to have His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent uh, visiting. And as I say, his particular significance, not only is he representative of Her Majesty the Queen for this very important jubilee, and of course Her Majesty has 
that's had her own jubilee in the in in, in uh, celebrated not only in the UK but uh, but throughout the Commonwealth. Um, uh, so he's not only the representative of Her Majesty, but this particular significance is that he was actually here on that day uh, 50 years ago. Um, so he, he was, was here in 1862. The yes, Duke of he was. Kent. He's yes. coming back. He's coming back. 50 to years. represent Britain. Uh, to represent the, the UK. Uh, to represent the Her Majesty, indeed. Um, uh, so he will be attending the formal celebrations um, uh, on the 9th, uh, but he'll also be undertaking a, a short program where he will see some examples of uh, the bilateral relationship and the wide range of the bilateral relationship I mentioned before, whether that's trade, um, uh, military links, um, arts and, and culture, um, uh, and, and some other things. So it's really a chance for him to uh, celebrate with Uganda um, uh, and uh, I guess a little bit of a trip down memory lane as he was here 50 years ago, right. um, but also to see uh, how the relationship has changed and some of the examples of of what we are doing across a wide spectrum. And uh, how long is he staying? Uh, a, f a few days. So um, he's arriving just before the, uh, the uh, anniversary uh, celebrations and leaving just after. So I say he's, he's got a chance to, uh, uh, to, to see not only Kampala, but he'll be doing a little bit of travel as well. Daniel, where, where else do you think the British government can help? But, but maybe before we get to that, let's talk about what other things the DF DFID does here. Well, I mentioned uh, kind of quite a range of things, I suppose, we're doing. I mean, um, I actually spent much of today um, in Chang Kwanzi uh, district. You can uh, pronounce it quite I, well. Thank you. I worked on it quite a few times, not just before. Say a little bit Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been. Can I try to get Chang Kwanzi? Oh, yes. Is it sort of there? Um, I had to get it right before my speech this morning. Uh, I was there, and uh, your Prime Minister was there. I had the great honour to meet him for the first time today. Um, and we were launching together um, the extension of the SAGE program, the Social Assistance Grants for Empowerment, the cash for the old elderly people. For the elderly, exactly, the um, Senior Citizens Grant. So we were launching that in uh, Chan Kwanzi. I think I got it not so good that time, actually. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, that's a program that has the potential to really have a huge impact on poverty here. I mean, you know, older people in Uganda, as in many places, uh, live often quite vulnerable lives. Um, they've worked very hard all their lives, they've made decisions and choices, they've brought up their children. In the case of people here in Uganda, of course, many of them to their formative adulthood would have been alive under the times we talked about, the dark times before 1986, and they would have had to make sacrifices and decisions, and you know, these are big, important, you know, dramatic lives. And then at the end of one's life, to be treated perhaps as if you're less important, you're weak, you can't produce things, is terrible. So it's a great great testament, I think, to the government here that the program of uh, SAGE is being rolled out and supporting um, these vulnerable people. We've seen fantastic examples of where people who previously were very desperate have been able to use this small cash grant, it's 24,000 Uganda shillings a month, to invest, for instance, in buying pigs and then selling piglets and then buying land with the proceeds and then building houses and then renting those houses to people. And there's actually quite a big change that you can see. There's lots of good examples out there. Um, so I, I think that's the kind of program that can really help, not only to help those people, but actually it's a vision of Uganda's future, a middle-income country um, in which uh, everyone benefits, in which the, sort of the wealth that is generated doesn't only benefit the wealthier, but it benefits the more vulnerable, the poorer as well. So I think that's a very exciting program, and it points the way towards uh, Uganda's future success. It is a big program, very exciting, like you said, and it's been led by the British government. Well, it's not being led by the British government, it's being led by the government of Uganda. Um, the, the majority of funding is from the British government at the moment. Um, not only us, but actually the, uh, the government of the Republic of Ireland is also supporting it, um, and UNICEF are also supporting it. So at the moment, it's a pilot. And so the reason we're shouldering most of the actual cost of it is because it's a pilot. The government of Uganda clearly has made a commitment to it, not only in actually the ruling party's manifesto, but the FDC and the DP 
you know, the they share that party release. commitment. Yeah, they don't agree on many things, but the same they, they agree they, on that. They agree on this one, apparently. Uh, and indeed, parliamentarians and others have really shown support for it. The plan is basically, as years go by and the pilot is shown, then the government of Uganda takes on the larger, larger, larger share of paying for this so that it's sustainable into the future. And of course, when oil revenues come on stream, that, that's kind of one of the revenues that will be able to help support these kind of programs going forward. What, 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 what else can the British government help, do you think? What other sectors? You help the elderly significantly. Well, where else do you think? Well, I mentioned... Uh, uh, you want to have infrastructure through the EU, roads... Exactly. And, uh, I mean, I think this is, this is a key area. I mean, you know, we, what we're seeing is enormous progress in the last 25 years or so. Um, but I mentioned before this issue of jobs. I think we really can play a part in supporting the government and other bodies here to create the kind of better business environment um, that will help to bring in more investment and create the sort of formal sector jobs that are going to be so important. That's one key area. I think oil and gas is another key area. There's a number of things we can do, continued work in health, and that's why we're focusing in those areas I mentioned before as part of our current four-year operational plan. Well, let's talk about, before we hear from the listeners, let's talk about the oil and gas sector transparency. We had recently, I think, well, from one of the diplomats who was telling us that Uganda is supposed to have agreed to join the EITI, the expi uh, you know, that, that initiative, the transparency initiative, extractive industries transparency initiatives. It hasn't signed on yet. Why is it so slow? Uh, it's a British based, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's an initiative that comes, out, I think, out of the UK, the EITI. Yeah, well, actually, um, we probably shouldn't claim credit entirely for it in the UK, but actually, in an earlier life, I actually worked extensively in the EITI Secretariat for the UK government, so um, I was quite involved in it. And I do think it's an incredibly important initiative. And the whole idea of it, of course, is that you, as you say, increase transparency in the oil sector, and you basically get the companies to disclose what they pay to the government, and the government discloses what they receive from the companies, and then you look publish at what you pay. So publish what you pay exactly, and then you can see basically are there discrepancies between what one says and what the other says, and it's a really useful way of starting to. Um, improved governance in the oil sector. And there's been some really big successes in countries such as uh, Nigeria and, and others that have traditionally successes. struggled. Uh, the early EITI report, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative report in Nigeria, identified over a billion dollars of unpaid taxes um, within the oil sector, not really through tax avoidance, but through a failure to follow changing tax regimes. There are other examples around the world where that sort of transparency has really shown substantial results. So I think it's great. Uganda should um, pursue uh, EITI, should implement it. They have said very clearly mm -hmm. that they will do so, so that's fantastic. Um, it's not a matter of just signing on and then you're in there. You have to observe the rules. You yeah. have to observe the rules, and there's a you know, clear validation and scrutiny of what you do. So it's a big job, and I think they've been investing in the processes to ensure that as they sign on, they will then be able to move forward to validation and proper implementation. That's it from the listeners. This is Spectrum on Radio on tonight. Is Uganda headed in the right direction? 50 years after 10 years in Independence from Britain. You can call in now. Our number zero four one four three four eight one 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 zero three one two two six zero three nine zero zero three one two two six one three nine zero. Spectrum hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Your name? Yeah, you is the name. Thanks for the video. Uh, one second. They have said for One. The the history of Uganda has a map responsibility that should come with leadership so that uh, whoever is in power, whether it's designed over peasants, the peasants will should not be influenced by donations from cash envelopes so that uh, even their goals of wanting a former colony or protectorate achieve a uh, good uh, goal. Two, I don't know what I think about uh, the in because I think today, for example, if some people want to express a will that is not uh, in conformity with the fifty-year celebration, why should they why should they be incarcerated and uh, why should they be tortured? That's my wish to find out from them that they put us right. Other you would think they are best fellows because after all, the next few they are they will be here, and they will be also beneficiaries one or the other. Good evening. Spectrum, hello. Hello. Yes, your name? I'm Mukoti Wassa from Katanga. Wassa, welcome, Spectrum. Yes. Yeah. 
Kaswa Kasamet, you want us to call you? We might not be able to do that tonight. Spectrum Mala. Yes, your name? Good evening, your name. Yes, Robert. Spectrum, hello. Hello. Yes, your name? My name is Sam, and I'm calling from Morocco. Yes, Sam. Uh, I'd like to know whether the British government is considering, whether we have the area of health, whether they are considering um, support of the area of chronic diseases. They think there is any evidence that's coming from the World Health Organization and other you know, organizations showing that in sub-Saharan Africa people are growing fat. They're eating less uh, healthy foods and having complications that come from that, such as diabetes and hypertension. And that is, you know, in the early stages of this epidemic, and it's something that could be stopped in its tracks if enough investment is done in it. So I'm wondering whether this is already being considered. All right. Yes, sorry, your name? Hello? Yes, my name is Gamhanda. Gamhanda. And uh, I am... Please, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to switch off your radio. Could you switch off your radio walk away from it? Okay. Um, one of the comments is, uh, thank you very much, because without uh, the British, we would not have become enlightened. Uh, so we thank them for colonization on one hand. Uh, <laughs> The, one of the problems we have is our land structure, which was really an architect and the result of uh, colonization. We have one of the worst land structures is that because the British were corrupting the, the Bujiko and the Bujiko people in, in Uganda, and uh, we have what we have, and we think they should also try and help there. On the other hand, we encourage their efforts to remain supportive in the colony, though we need some reparation from Europe. <laughs> Yes, your name? Yes, Good evening, Peter. Yeah, this is Waboga, Peter. I greet you on the in the studio, and uh, everyone, my, my issue is about visas. The, the practice of uh, getting fees from an applicant before one goes to an interview, so that whether he fails the interview for the visa or not, he one loses the money. I think uh, really the diplomatic mission shouldn't do that. The person should be interviewed first. If they fail, then they go away. All right. They go through the visa interviews, then they pay for the visa. All right. I would like to ask the High Commissioner, Your Excellency, to consider changing that practice where people who are applying for visas to your countries should be interviewed first so that when they uh, they, they succeed, they pay for the fees for the visa. All right. But the truth is currently is that they pay before they undergo interviews. All right. Bill, you can't lose a lot of money. All right. It's unfair, I think. Thank you very much. On that visa, let's get back to the studio. It's not been incomplete without talking about the visas. Madam High Commission. Yeah, shall I, shall I answer that point about the, the visas? Um, this, this is a point which um, I've heard uh, uh, in other countries as well. Um, what I need to explain is that the, the, the the fee for the visa um, uh, application is part of it. It's not specific just to, to Uganda. It's the same system which is in place all over the world. Um, and it's to cover the cost of processing the visa application. And whether that application is successful or not, there is a cost to processing it. And the visa operation globally has to be um, paid for, has to pay for itself. And that is why the fees are charged up front um, because whether the application is uh, say successful or not that process still takes time uh, and has to be paid for the checks have to be done so that's why the fees are charged up front
reparations for Bunyoro. The Queen is supposed to have given some money to the Bunyoro Kingdom. It's never got to them. The president still is keeping it in safe custody. Well, Tell us about that. All, all the um, again, don't want to get into the to, to the past, but as, a, as a general as a general as a general principle, all the um, the uh, obligations and responsibilities which would have um, uh, come from the, the the colonial times actually passed to the government of Uganda uh, 50 years ago next week on independence. So again, this is really something for the government of Uganda. Chronic diseases? Yeah, chronic I'm being a little bit autobiographical. Years ago, I used to work for the British Diabetic Association, and then diabetes was very much seen as a sort of developed world problem. And the caller is entirely correct, of course. Diseases like diabetes, hypertension, other chronic conditions are spreading throughout the developing world and becoming major problems and major issues. The government of Uganda, of course, is aware of this, and I know that the kind of health sector plans are looking at this as a, as a really big issue. For our part, we provide sector budget support directly into the health budget of the government of Uganda, um, which is uh, then up to the government to decide on its use and where, it's, where that money is prioritised. Um, so really, it's, I think, again, it's a lead for the government of Uganda to look at responding to chronic conditions, and I think it's something that actually is, is, is being looked at by the government. I was going to mention land structure as well, just because um, this has come up a lot since I've been here in the last few weeks, and clearly, you know, we talked about jobs and employment, and agriculture is a big area where in, you know, new investments and new um, agricultural productivity could employ a lot of people and help in terms of rural um, livelihoods. And the land issue does come up time and time again. Again, it's not actually an area that we're directly working on, other donors are, and of course the government is, but it is going to be a big issue that needs to be tackled to really unlock the kind of potential that there is in agriculture, I think. But I Madam High Commissioner, you've paid fellows with the government. Some people don't agree with it. They, you know, they think there's a lot of corruption. They also think you're not bothered about the longevity of this current leadership because you have a monarch that's been there for more than 50 years. Is that a cultural thing? You tolerate people staying power long? Well, of your own uh, sorry, I couldn't. I was having difficulty hearing some of those those uh, those questions which came up um, before. But um, uh, uh, I, uh, we would not. Uh, the the term bedfellows is a rather pejorative one. Um, I would say we have a constructive partnership with the government of Uganda, and that doesn't mean to say uh, that we always agree on every single issue. Um, most partners have. Uh, disagreements at some uh, point or another, um, but our focus is on helping uh, the government of Uganda uh, to work for the good of its of the people of Uganda, whether that's uh, economically on development issues or on uh, good governance. And, and Daniel's mentioned some of the things that that we're doing, and um, we've also referred to um, work that we're doing s supporting uh, people who are working on democratic space uh, and accountability. So um, it's 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 certainly not uh, it's uh, bedfellows is not a term that I would uh, would use. It's a constructive partnership. Constructive partnership. Are you happy with the longevity of a leader in power? Uh, the length of the time that a leader spends in power really should be up to uh, the people. Well, culturally, you're a monarch. Is that, does that make you comfortable, or you, you, it's something that we you don't a, worry too much about? We have a democracy with elections for parliament every uh, every four years. So, uh, and Her Majesty just having celebrated her her diamond. And Jubilee is um, was a cause for celebration for the British people. Daniel, just before we go, let's talk about trade a little bit. It's a little bit lopsided. You import to you, you export more than you import from Uganda. Is that likely to change any time? So any affirmative action on that side? Um, well, as I mentioned before, we're very keen to grow the trade relationship. I think it'd be fantastic to see um, a lot more trade in both directions. It'd be good for the UK and it'd be fantastic for Uganda. So um, it's definitely a key part of our relationship, that constructive relationship that Alison was just talking. About. Well, we have to go. Our time is up. Thank you very much, dear, dear guests. Uh, Her Excellency Alison, Alison Blackburn, British High Commissioner to Uganda, taking our questions all in good. <laughs> good stuff. Thank you very much for coming, Inspector Madam. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Daniel Graymo, Head of Office, UK Department for International Development at DFID. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. A pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host, Edmond Chisito Spectrum. We'll be back tomorrow. Up next is the news in English. The Woolworths Quality Sale is now on. Get up to 40% of selected fashion clothing at Woolworths Metroplex Mall, Northern Bypass.